So uh, we're talking about an iterated function system, uppercase N. That's always going to denote the number of functions in the iterated function system. And A over here, uh, compact set A, is going to always denote the attractor of the iterated function system. The, the points in the attractor have addresses, and those addresses are infinite words in the alphabet 1 to n. And I'm going to denote uh, the code space, in other words, the set of all such sequences by this i. And to be more precise, there's what I'll call the coding map that uh, assigns to every element of the code space, every such sequence, an element, uh, a point in the attractor. And it's given by this uh, composition, the limit of this composition uh, in the Hausdorff metric. Uh, this limit is a single point. Uh, I should go back for a second here. Let me say one more thing before I uh, go to that slide. I want to make one more assumption. The functions in my uh, iterated function system, besides assuming that they are contractions, I'm also going to assume that they, have, that they're, they are invertible and that the inverses are continuous. I'm going to assume that throughout. OK, so back here, the, the coding map is this uh, composition of the corresponding functions in the iterated function system. This is a single point. Uh, it's independent of the compact set C. Uh, it's uh, surjective. It's onto the attractor. And it is a continuous map uh, where uh, the uh, metric on, on the code space is such that two sequences are close if they agree on a large initial segment. The inverse, if I take a point in the attractor and take its inverse under the coding map, I'm going to call that the set of addresses of x. So here's a very simple example. So we have uh, two functions. Instead of calling them 1 and 2 here, I call them 0 and 1 for reasons that will become apparent in, in, in a second. Uh, it's 1 half x, 1 half x plus a half. This is on the real line. Uh, the first function takes the unit interval and uh, maps it into 0 to a half. The second maps it into a half to 1. So the interval from 0 to 1 is the attractor. If you think of an element in the code space as a decimal, in other words, you put the decimal point at the beginning, then the image of a, an element in the code space is nothing more than the point in the attractor uh, that corresponds to that decimal. So as we all know, the addresses for 1 half, there are two addresses for 1 half. And uh, this is in binary. And uh, one of them ends in infinitely many zeros, and the other one ends in infinitely many ones. So it's often the case that uh, points in the attractor have many addresses. So the next thing we would like to do is to assign to each point in the attractor a unique one of its addresses. So uh, that's uh, what we call a section. So a section is a map that goes in the opposite direction. For each point in the attractor, we assign an element of the code space, a sequence, uh, in such a way that the composition with the coding map is the identity. In other words, we're picking out one of its addresses. So there's a, there's a, a way to um, construct sections. And that's called masking. Oops. Oh. <coughs> uh, so a mask is nothing more than a partition of the attractor such that each, uh, each element in the mask is contained in the corresponding image of the attractor under the corresponding function in the IFS. So if I'm given a mask, uh, there's a way to construct the section as follows. So start with a, a point in the attractor, say x0 then this mass section is given by the sequence, oops, that's a mistake there, that should be a 2, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, by this little uh, dynamical system. So first, since, since a mask is a partition, x0 belongs into one of the sets in the mask, let's say m sigma 1. Then sigma 1 is the first element uh, in its address. Um, because of this property, we can take the inverse of x0 under the, the next uh, function, 
and we'll call that x1. That lies in some element of the mass, say m of sigma 2. So then sigma 2 there will be the next uh, element in the address, and so on. So we'll just continue this. And so for each point in the, in the attractor, we, are, we get a uh, element uh, of the code space. Okay, here's a, the same simple example I had before where the attractor is 0, 1. There's not much uh, choice here for the mask. Uh, the mask has two sets in it. One of them is the interval from 0 to a half. The other one is the interval from a half to 1. And uh, the only uh, possibility, there's two possibilities uh, depending on what, whether the 1 half lies in the first half or in the second half. If one half lies in the first interval of the mask, then it turns out that the section, the address for one half, one fourth, one eighth, and so forth, ends in infinitely many ones. On the other hand, if the one half lies in the second set of the mask, then uh, tau of one half, one fourth, one eighth, and so on, ends the addresses end in infinitely many zeros, which is, is nice. You have this kind of consistency and uh, we'll call this kind of consistency shift invariance. Now, not every section comes from a mask, but it turns out that every shift invariant section comes from a mask. So the theorem, so from here on, I'm going to assume that all the sections are mass sections, or another equivalently, every section is shift invariant. All right, now I could define what is meant by a fractal transformation. So here we have two IFSs on spaces x and y with the same number of functions. So a fractal transformation takes the attractor of the first IFS to the attractor of the second IFS. It's defined this way. You start with a point over here, over here. You, you take its address. Then you go over to here, and you look at the point that corresponds to that address. Or in other words, a, a, a fractal transformation is such that you take a point in the first, uh, the fir uh, you take a point in the first attractor, you look at its address, and then you take the point in the second attractor with the same address. Here's some examples. So on the left is a an attractor of an IFS. Here's one that's been fractally transformed. I'll be a little bit more precise in my second example, which is actually on the next slide. Uh, here's the IFS. Well, it's an ISF, uh, IFS of this type. The big square there is going to be the attractor. Uh, there are four functions in the IFS, and uh, these are functions that uh, I call uh, biaffine because they are affine in each variable if you hold the other variable fixed. Using such biaffine transformations, you can map the square A, B, C, D, uppercase, uh, to each, of the, each uh, of the four smaller quadrilaterals, uh, the uppercase letters corresponding to the lowercase letters. So clearly, the attractor of this is the, uh, is the square. You take two such change the point in the middle here, and you can get two such IFSs. And here's an example of the fractal transformation that you get. Actually, there's two, two examples here. You start with that image. What we're doing here is we're sort of stealing colors here. To find out if you have a little a point over here, you want to know what color, then you take, well, I, sh I should have said this already, but the, the uh, the fractal transformation that I get using the IFSs in the previous slide, um, those turn out to be homeomorphisms in this case. I mean, we have some uh, results about continuity of fractal transformations, but I don't have time to actually state those here. But in this case, it's, a, it's a, actually a homeomorphism. So to figure out what color to put here, you go, you take the inverse of the fractal homeomorphism, and you steal the color from up there. And this shows you what the fractal transformation looks like. Uh, there's also uh, triaffine uh, 
you can take the analog in three dimensions, and here you have an example uh, of a, such a three-dimensional example. Here's another example. The two IFSs are F and G. The first IFS there is a, sort of like the, the, the very simple example that we had before. Uh, it's four functions. The first one takes the unit interval, mops it into zero to a quarter, the second from a quarter to a half, half to three quarters. The attractor is the unit interval. The second example over there, you could look on the right, and uh, these are uh, similitudes that take the big square, A, B, C, D, with the uppercase A, B, C, D, and maps it in, there's four functions, maps it into each of the four little squares by similitude, again with the uppercase letters corresponding to the lowercase letters. It turns out that the corresponding fractal transformation is nothing more than the Hilbert space filling curve. Or in other words, it is a continuous function from the first attractor, the unit interval, onto the uh, unit square. Uh, in textbooks, you see sort of approximations to this Hilbert's uh, function in figures like the one on the left. Uh, here's another example. The, the two IFSs, in this case, they are affine maps. Uh, the first one corresponds, again, there's four functions. The first one you can see from the first uh, picture over there. Uh, the second IFS over here, again, taking the uppercase uh, letters to the lowercase letters. Uh, here you see, gives you an idea of what the fractal transformation looks like when you look at it as a picture. Uh, this one is uh, uh, kind of interesting because uh, not only is this a homeomorphism, but it also preserves area. Areas are preserved under this. I'll say a little bit more about that time permitting as we go on. Okay, now what I would like to do is uh, fractal transformation goes from the attractor of the first IFS to the attractor of the second IFS. What I'd like to do is extend that notion so that it, the fractal transformation can be considered on the whole ambient space from X to Y. And I think I'm going to use hats. Whenever I take this global approach, I'm going to use uh, the notation and put hat on the symbol. Okay, so to do this, I'm going to start with a, an element in the code space, in other words, a sequence of, of numbers, one to n, and I'm going to fix this throughout. I'm always going to use the letter theta, and uh, let's call this sequence full with respect to the IFS. If, when you take this corresponding, uh, well, first, start with an el any element in the space x, then take this composition of the corresponding functions, functions corresponding to the elements of theta, that after a finitely many compositions, I'm going to add end in the attractor. If it has that property, I'm going to call that theta full. And from here on, I'm going to assume that all this theta is full. And it, it seems like that's a, a it's not as big an assumption as you may think because it turns out that almost all theta are full. And when I say almost all, I, I, there, you can interpret that in a couple of ways. Uh, the, the set of all full elements in the code space is dense in the code space. And another way you could think about it is if you start picking out the elements of theta, one, two, three, four, if you start picking them out say you pick theta one at random uh, with some positive probability, then you pick out theta two independent of theta one, again, with some positive probability, and you just keep doing this, then with probability one, the sequence that you will get will be full. So again, we're going to assume from here on that this fixed theta is full. Okay, so in order to extend the uh, fractal transformation to the whole space, I'm going to first extend the code space. So the code space is, the, the sigma here is a, a, an element in the, what we had as a standard code space. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bunch of the thetas at the beginning mm -hmm. in sequence, but I'm going to put minus signs on them. And then there's a sort of a technical 
uh, condition here, uh, sort of a cancellation. You don't want the last theta to be the first sigma. So here's an example uh, of such a uh, sequence where you have finitely many uh, thetas at minus thetas at the beginning. So theta 1 is 2, theta 2 is 1, theta 3 is 1. So this is a typical example of a global code space. So now I'm going to define a global coding map, which is again, just the standard coding map, but I'm going to these minus elements at the beginning, this finitely <coughs> minus elements at the beginning, I'm going to take this composition of the corresponding inverses of the functions in the IFS. So that gives me an extension of the, the standard uh, coding map. And then I'm going to do the same kind of thing for this section. I'm going to start with an element, any element in the space, x. Then, because I'm assuming that theta is full, I could take this composition and this thing will land in the attractor. So I could take the standard section for that point, and then I'm just going to tack these uh, negatives in front. Of course, these negatives correspond to those positive over there. Okay, so I have a global coding map and a global section. And now if we start with our two iterated function systems with the same number of functions, then I could uh, define a global fractal transformation in exactly the same way we defined the uh, original fractal transformation. I'm just, uh, just taking the composition. Okay. So here's an example. It's a little, I can't, uh, this is in the plane. The original, um, the original figure is a checkerboard pattern. It extends to the whole plane. And uh, below, we see two images under a global fractal transformation. Uh, again, this is, is kind of special. It has, a, a, it is a, again, a fractal homeomorphism. It's a homeomorphism, and it, again, is, this one is area preserving, preserves areas. OK, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take two special cases. So the first special case here is where first I'm going to take Euclidean space, and I'm going to make the following assumptions. First, that the attractors are not are non-overlapping, which means that the images under a pair of distinct elements in the IFS don't overlap. And I'm also going to assume that the functions are affine, and that the determinants in the first IFS are the same as the determinant of the corresponding function in the second IFS. By determinant, I mean the determinant of the linear, linear part. So here's a, an example. This is the same example I had at the very beginning. You take it, the attractor is the unit interval. The two functions are, again, denoted by the, uh, by the letters. This is the same one, but you see I flipped the first interval there. And here's, the, in the third IFS, I flipped both intervals. So um, we have two fractal transformations, FG1, FG2. Uh, here are the graphs of those uh, two transformations. Clearly, they are not continuous functions this time. Uh, but it turns out that they are continuous almost everywhere, almost everywhere with respect to the Lebesgue measure. They're invertible almost everywhere, and the uh, inverse is just the fractal transformation in the opposite direction, and uh, the fractal transformation is volume preserving, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Okay, so now I'm going to, let's start with the attractor A, and let's consider the, the, uh, all of the uh, square inner product. What I want to do is I want to give you an induced linear operator on these L2 functions. And we'll call that linear operator UFG. Again, uh, we're talking about two iterated function systems. And there's a uh, fractal transformation between them. So I want, I'm going to, the U is going to act on the 
square integrable functions. And it's this way. If I want to know what happens to a function phi, then I say, OK, well, what does it do to y? You go backwards. You take the pullback from the uh, fractal transformation, and you see what phi does on that. So you're just pulling, pulling it back. And it turns out that this uh, induced linear operator is an isometry. In other words, it preserves the inner product. Um, that's all I'm going to need. Uh, here's an example. Uh, let's take the, the uh, case where we have these three IFSs that I mentioned before. You have these two linear, these two fractal transformations. I'm going to consider the following L2 functions on the interval 0, 1. This is, this is a sequence of functions. This is the standard uh, sines, the Fourier sine series uh, orthonormal basis for the L2 functions. So since this operator U preserves the inner product, and when you take, their, take the images, oops, when you take the images, that those also form an orthonormal basis for the L2 functions. So what we get is a kind of a uh, fractal Fourier theory. So uh, here's an example. So here we have the constant function. On the left is the st a standard approximation by uh, Fourier sine series. And on the right, uh, you see the fractalized version of that. Uh, The Gibbs phenomena over there on the left seems to have shifted a little bit to, towards, the, towards the center there. Here's another example. This time, it's an approximation to the step function, to a step function. OK, so uh, I want to give you one other uh, application of this. Uh, this time, I'm not going to be talking about uh, fractal transformations. I'm going to be talking about how you could use the global uh, addressing that we talked about earlier to create tilings. So again, I'm fixing this theta that is, um, again, assuming it's full. Uh, let's say theta starts 2, 1, 2, 1. Before I can tell you about the tilings, I have to tell you what a theta sequence of rooted trees is. It's an infinite sequence of trees. Uh, these are rooted trees. Uh, every node except the root or a, a leaf has exactly n children labeled 1 to n. In our case, the n here is just 2. Uh, the, root, the, the root has n minus 1 children. Uh, to be exact, this has no child labeled 2 because the first element here is 2. This has no child labeled 1 because the, first ele the second element is 1, and so on. And other than that, uh, the, this uh, sequence of, of rooted trees is completely arbitrary. Uh, to each leaf in any of these trees, I'm going to assign a finite sequence. I'm going to call this mapping alpha. Uh, rather than define it in general, I'm going to just take an example. Let's take the green leaf over here. I'm going to tell you how to assign a finite sequence to it. It's the fourth tree, so I'm going to go 2, 1, 2, 1, the, four, the first four elements, but I'm going to make them negative. And then from there on, I'm just going to go from the root to the leaf and just copy down the, uh, the label, so 222. Two, two. So I'm going to use this alpha on the next slide. So again, recall that we have the global code, code space, and we have the global section that takes any element of x to an element in this code space. OK, so I'm going to define uh, a tile t, which is going to depend on theta and this the sequence of trees. V here is a leaf. So what I'm saying here is that this is all the elements in the space whose address starts with alpha of V. Remember, we had this alpha of V. This dots means that after, after that, it, it could be anything. So I don't care what, what it is after. Any, as long as it starts with alpha of V, then I take the closure. Okay, So that's going to be a tile. Now, take all such tiles for all the leaves of all the trees. So in other words, again, uh, this tile is the closure of the set of points whose address begins with 
alpha v, the address given by this global section. Okay, so the theorem is that uh, this will always give you a tiling of the space. So let me give a couple of examples. Um, this is a tiling by the Tribonacci Rossi tiles. There are uh, three, it's given, uh, there, the tiling consists of Rossi tiles at three different scales. Uh, here's an example based on what's sometimes referred to as the golden B polygon. Uh, this is due to uh, Amon. Uh, it's the only polygon, except for right triangles, that can be partitioned into a distinct pair of scaled copies of itself. Uh, take the right, uh, an appropriate uh, uh, sequence, theta sequence of trees, and uh, you get uh, the tiling on, on the right. It extends, of course, to the whole plane. Uh, here's another example uh, using the same method. Uh, and there are many, many more of these. They have the following, these, this family of tilings has the following property. Up to similarity, there's just one tile. Up to congruence, there are finitely many tiles. The tiling is self-similar. That means that there's an, a sim similitude, such that if I hit the whole tiling, the whole plane with the similitude, each of the little tiles, the original tiles gets blown up. Each of those blown up tiles is the union of original tiles. Uh, the tiling is quasi-periodic. That means that every finite patch of this tiling appears everywhere in the tiling. Uh, here's a last example. This is a tiling by uh, what's usually referred to as, as Robinson tiles. Uh, this is just an example to show that the attractor could be overlapping and you still get a nice tiling. Here, there are three functions in the IFS. It takes this tile to the sort of gray one over here. The second takes it into the sort of yellowish over here. And the third function takes it into this sort of brownish over here, but they overlap, you see, over here. Pick the appropriate uh, theta sequence of, uh, of uh, trees, and you get a tiling that looks, uh, that looks like this. It's kind of reminiscent of the Penrose tilings, but it's not exactly the Penrose tilings. I should say here that you don't really get, I mean, theta was fixed uh, in, my, in my presentation, but actually theta is a parameter. I could pick any, there's infinitely many, many possibilities for theta, and for, in this case, for example, there will be infinitely many uh, corresponding tilings. OK, so thank you. Uh, that's uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, that's uh, practically transformed Niagara Falls. Question? Yeah. I had a crazy question. So if you have over you have the potential to lose a lot of information when you go from one, transforming from one thing to another, right? Well, the thing is, the, the section, so when you overlap, you know, there's multiple yeah. addresses. Yeah. So the, what the section does, it picks out one address. Yeah. So you right. have the potential to lose a lot. Is it possible to get an exact sequence of fractal tra transformations? And I'm not even sure what I mean exactly by this. Because you've got exact sequences in algebra, which tend to be useful for oh, everything. Oh, exact sequences in, in that sense. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I know that. I mean, I, I can't say anything about exact sequences, but you could, if the attractor is non-overlapping, you can get a. Uh, it simplifies things. You can get yeah, a lot yeah. of results that you can't get in the overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you, thank you.